Ready for fun? I think so. Um, I'm in, you're in. Uh, the participant count is going up though, so maybe we can wait a minute. Oh, yeah. The people who are connected here. Let's wait quite a while. Um, Tom, you will have until what um, eighteen forty. Okay, so that's uh, fifty minutes from now. Okay. Then we'll have another break, and uh, people can go from there to whichever session they sure. want to connect. 1840. How long ago did the other group break up? As long as it took me to get out of that session and into this one. Okay. So less than a minute. I just sent you my uh, area code. Okay, thanks. Slack. Uh, nice talks today. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm um, sure you, you'll have a good night's sleep Sunday night. <laughs> <laughs> well, now we got a message here from John saying he just got in on the third try. So um, maybe that's just because I was a slow typer to get this set up. Or um, maybe there's some reason it, it takes three tries. But um, Hopefully, uh, everyone else is having good luck who wants to attend. And um, let me just close a couple windows that I have here. And make sure you turn your camera off while I'm talking, because we don't want to see you nodding off from hearing the same talk again and again. <laughs> I don't think that's going to be a problem. So I've switched it up a little bit, but. Anyway, I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot more good talks coming up too. Yeah, yeah, we've got a, a lot of good stuff in the next two days. And uh, just uh, while we're waiting to see if anybody else joins, tomorrow morning we have Catherine Blundell from Oxford University. I do not know her personally, but several of the people involved in this workshop do. And I hear that she is um, very interesting and also very funny. So that's exciting. Good. And she's she's a a uh, dame. She has an order of the British Empire. So um, wow. that will be interesting. So, yeah. OK, well, I think, uh, Tom, you should go ahead and get started. Okay. And um, I will kind of keep an eye on the time um, and have fun, everybody. Great. Good. Hi, Whidbey and uh, Greg and everybody else. Uh, we got a lot of ground to cover. I don't have much time. We're going to sprint here. Uh, thanks for thanks for coming, and uh, I hope that what you're about to hear will uh, be helpful for you. Um, oh, by the way, um, in your upper right hand corner is a view button, and there's uh, some different view options that you might want to experiment with. Uh, I find this one to be the best uh, for the talks here uh, at the conference. Uh, I'm the author of the RSpec program and a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope. Uh, today, we're going to talk about the star analyzer grading. Um, give me just a second. No, we'll, we'll just let it keep playing. I can't see myself. Hopefully, you can see me. Um, the star analyzer grading is only $200. So getting started in all this, uh, if you're not doing it today, is pretty inexpensive. It's not like you need to jump to the, the higher end devices that we're hearing really cool devices a lot about. In fact, very few people start out, uh, almost none start out with a slit device for reasons we'll talk about in a few minutes. You know, I thought I'd mention this. If you had waited until you had a PhD in astrophysics to enjoy the stars, you wouldn't be an amateur astronomer today. Uh, the point is that you can get started in this with very little knowledge. I'm going to sound like I know what I'm talking about today, but I'm like a really broad river that's really shallow. So jump in and uh, I'll, I'll do everything I can from here over the coming months and years if you jump in to help you be a success. There's lots of ways to mount a star analyzer. One, is with, one of which is just to put it on the nose piece or on the lens cap threads of a DSLR like you see in the upper left-hand corner there. We have this little adapter. Uh, which I just dropped. 
Uh, there's other ways to use it. It fits on almost any camera. Here's a cool fits camera. It can be mono color. Uh, this is a ZWO video camera. In this case, in many cases, the grading just threads right on. Uh, you can put it in a filter wheel. Um, you can mount your DSLR on top of your uh, current imaging system. You may, for example, be all set up to do uh, uh, other AAVSO work and, and not want to disturb that setup. So there's lots of ways to use the grading. When we put a grading in the light path, we get a spectrum on our sensor. And that's what it looks like in an image. Now, there may be other stars involved there, but what I wanted to show you was, again, here's the star, which is called the zero order. And this is the spectrum. This happens to be in color because it's easier to see what's going on. Mono is more sensitive and a little bit better scientifically, but a lot of people use color successfully. I like using it in education and outreach, uh, whether it's even sidewalk astronomy. Uh, Tom, there's a gap there. Tom? A, yes. Um, you need to share your screen. Oh, man, I can't believe it. Rookie mistake. Thanks. There. OK, so let's uh, let's come back and just point this out. Select that if you if you can. Uh, on the view button in your upper right hand corner that'll make life easier for you here's the star analyzer and now i can see myself <laughs> glad you were there ken uh so uh there's lots of ways to mount the star analyzer as i mentioned and this is the quote i wanted to share with you you saw you heard me say it a few minutes ago uh the idea is don't hold back just because you think that it might be hard it's really not hard and you learn what you need to learn as you go uh, so there's lots of ways to mount cameras uh, with gratings. Uh, this is the one I was showing you a minute ago. I guess you saw it at least in video. But you can see here, here's a cool fits camera. Here's a uh, imaging source. Or no, this is a ZWO camera. It can be color, can be mono. Uh, it's all very easy to set up with a couple little speed bumps we'll talk about in just a moment. Uh, oh, yeah, here was the uh, DSLR piggyback on your telescope. So there's what you get when you put a grading in the light path. You can see the spectrum and you can see the star, the zero order, as well as some gaps in the spectrum. There's a gap there. There's maybe some at least dimming in there. This is, this is what we work with when we're capturing spectrum. Now, don't think that just because this is an inexpensive system and, and is often used by people who are just starting that it doesn't have more advanced scientific applications. It's not all that, oh, those slit devices are the right stuff and this is just a baby toy. There's lots of interesting science that can be done as well as pro-am collaboration. So those gaps in the spectrum, just to review some of the science are again, different for different elements. You can see here, for example, hydrogen has a, a line or a gap uh, there, but it doesn't exist in helium. So, and for example, we use so much of the hydrogen lines when we're actually doing work that uh, we like to refer to them um, as a group of lines, the hydrogen bomber lines or series, and we've even given them Greek names like we give to the stars by intensity, of course, in the different constellations. For example, hydrogen beta here is that, well, I guess that's about robin egg blue. There's the alpha and red. So this is a periodic table that um, was mentioned yesterday by Stella. Uh, this is a table we created. Mostly the people who buy it are, uh, are educators, but a fair number of amateurs buy it for their wall too. I've got one up on the wall. Uh, it's a full size 36 by 24 inch table. You can see there, there's the hydrogen bomber lines. There's the hydrogen alpha. There's that robin egg blue beta and so forth. And look, of course, how those lines differ from the helium that you might, for example, put in a balloon at a florist. So these are just remarkable in the power that they give us to understand stars at a distance. And um, it's amazing to me, as you'll see in the next few minutes, what we can do. This is a great example of what can be done. These are separate images done with a star analyzer on an eight inch Newtonian and an imaging source video camera by Torsten Hansen. These are in temperature order. They're separate spectra. The hot stars are up here, the B stars, A stars, and you can see down here to the cool M stars. A couple quick examples on this. Notice how the spectra change by temperature. This is how professionals and now amateurs can determine star temperature. Real quickly here, you can see a terrible line. You can see these uh, these wide bands down here. Those aren't lines, those are like a forest, right? When a star is cool enough that a more complex molecule can exist in its outer gas shell, 
those complex molecules can create these bands. So when we see bands, we know we're looking at a relatively cool star like these M stars. The other thing to look at here real quickly is this series of lines here. Notice that they're much more prominent in the hydrogen or in the uh, type A star here. And that's because uh, that uh, just a tiny bit of science here, you learn more science as you go. You don't have to know quantum theory. You don't have to know really very much about the science to do exciting spectroscopy. The Bohr model, you may recall, has electrons orbiting in discrete shells around the, the nucleus of the atom. And those electrons can jump between levels. And when they jump between level four and level two in a hydrogen atom, they create this hydrogen beta, this is in the robin egg blue, the hydrogen beta line around 4,800. It's either a gap or a bright line called an absorption line or an emission line, depending on which way the electron's going. But that's all the theory we need to get into for our discussion today and to do a lot of the work here. In What's going on with these hotter stars is that when the electrons get pumped up, the stars are so hot, they don't stop at level four. A lot of them keep going up to level five and beyond. When that happens, they're not on level four to drop down to level two, so we don't have as strong lines here. With these stars, a lot of the electrons don't even get pumped up as high as level four, so they're not there to drop down to level two or to get pumped up to level four. So. Uh, that's the theory that helps us understand why different temperature stars have different spectra. This was done, I just want to point out, with a video camera and an eight inch telescope. So it's easy for anybody to do this. So see that uh, crosshairs there? There's a little dip, a little dimming in there. But of course, we can't write scientific papers by talking about there's a little dimming around the robin egg blue region. We need to be quantitative. And to do that, we generate an intensity graph. So this graph here, this axis is brightness. So the star here is very bright. So this is a very high peak, but the star is also very narrow. So this is a narrow peak. And this, if we look here, is dim. It gets brighter, 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 dimmer, dimmer, dimmer. So this starts out dim, gets brighter, 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 dimmer, dimmer, dimmer. But look at that dip. With that dip, we can create scientific data. We can look at the full width half maximum of the dip. We can look at where it's located, how it compares to other stars, how it looks next month. Like, for example, observing BE stars, we're looking at different uh, locations of dips. So this is science. Now, to get that graph, we use software. We're not going to talk a lot about software today. I have a workshop tomorrow where we'll talk a little bit about software and talk about how we create these intensity graphs. But for now, let's continue on and look at some other examples. Uh, I wanted to show you here, there's the intensity graph. First night out that I ever did spectroscopy, right outside in the backyard here, three miles from downtown Seattle. One great thing about spectroscopy is it's not nearly as sensitive to light pollution. You can do it during the full moon. Now, of course, not the dimmer objects, but with visual imaging, we're always trying to adjust and sort of get the color balance right for the aesthetics. We don't do that in spectroscopy. We want the photons exactly as, I, as they hit our sensor. So we, we can do it in our driveway. We don't have to go fleeing to a dark sky site to do a lot of interesting work. So this is my first night out here in Seattle. That peak there is the star. And there is the spectral data. And you can see some deep dips. That happens to be oxygen in the atmosphere. Uh, here's the, in the robin egg blue, there's that hydrogen beta line I mentioned. And again, these are being caused as the starlight leaves the star, goes through a cooler shell of hydrogen. And again, the hydrogen affects the light. And across those you know, great distances, we can now understand a lot about the star. So what else can you actually do? So here's a wide field view, just to give you the flavor for how it would look like, for example, in a DSLR. Uh, you can see uh, some stars here called the zero water and the spectra here. There's some gaps and some other gaps. Here's a star here with, with some lumps, right? Those are emission lines. Again, uh, they're just, they've saturated the pixels on my camera. So when Janet Simpson sent me the spectrum we're going to look at right now, I have a confession to make. 
I couldn't remember what a Wolfrie star was. You know, the thing is that over the, over the 20 or 30 years I've been doing astronomy, I've read about Wolfrie stars countless, not countless, half a dozen, a handful of times. But unless we actually have a use for the data, for most of us, especially as we get on in the years, it doesn't stick. The reason I want to point that out is because what I found is that when you own the data, when you've captured it, you have a very different relationship to it. You then go out and read something about it on Wikipedia and it sticks oftentimes. Wikipedia is our friend. And we heard a little bit about Wolfrie A stars from Stella yesterday. They're massive stars with intense stellar winds, perhaps becoming a, or headed towards being a supernova. And they have these emission features. Again, as we look at the spectrum, we can see these bright lines, carbon, carbon, carbon. Why would we be seeing carbon in a star? Well, remember, stars are burning through the elements, starting with hydrogen to helium. And part of that whole process includes carbon. And this is a later stage star, so that we're seeing the carbon emission lines with just 30 seconds on a DSLR with tracking. Without tracking, it's tough to do. We saw Lauren's great presentation yesterday where she talked about not using tracking, but tracking really is, uh, as somebody else mentioned, I think it was maybe you, Ken, uh, the most important component in a telescope system, uh, many people say, is good tracking. Let's look at another, um, another emission object. This is our beloved ring nebula. And you can see here two emission features, our hydrogen and our ionized oxygen. That's what that Roman numeral three means. It just means ionized. Some of the electrons have been pulled out. So most extended objects aren't as interesting as this in a slitless system. The M57 is because it's got just two bright features. But if we look at another um, emission object, let's look at it. Even though this is a star analyzer meeting, I, I want to show you the difference. This is with a slit spectrometer, which again is going to cost you, unless you make it yourself, 10 times as much. And then you're guiding on like a 10 micron slit and trying to capture your, uh, your, your target, you know, actually acquire your target on such a small slit, it's a lot more work. So the Orion Nebula has the same emission features, even though this is like an early state in a stellar history, as opposed to the very end of a star, like in that wolf A star. Notice there's our hydrogen alpha, and there's that ionized oxygen with that Roman numeral three, again, in the, what, that's the robin egg blue. Uh, no, that's not the robin egg blue. There it is over there. There's our hydrogen beta. So that's what a slit spectrometer can do. You know, I want to tell you a brief story. It's fun to remember when you didn't know something about a topic that you then become familiar with. In the early 1990s, I wanted to see uh, a Shoemaker Levy 9. I uh, went to a star party in Denver, downtown, first quarter, moon. I went out there, and when I looked over the observing field, I had never seen telescopes in person before. What I saw were those cannons that they shoot people out of in the circus. <laughs> they were Dobbs, of course. This is not that meeting. This is another club to which I spoke a few days ago. But I queued up. I looked through the Dob. It was being run by somebody like you and me, perhaps. Uh, and I was all excited. And when I looked at M42, what did I see? A smudge. It was mono. It was boring. And yet, even if you had the same experience, and many of us have, I still come back, as you'd probably do, to look at M42. Why would I do that if it's a smudge? Well, of course, we've got better telescopes, and we're at dark sky sites. And of course, we're much better at averted vision now, right? We can see uh, you know, with a more sensitive part of our eye. But in all seriousness, the reason we come back to M42 is because we understand what it is a lot more than we did that first time. The point is when you have more understanding, our visual understanding and our visual enjoyment gets deeper. And that's what spectroscopy has done for me. I, listen, I, I'm sure, literally sure that every speaker in this meeting knows more about spectroscopy than me. I'm not proud of the fact, but I wanna be honest about it because I think one of the obstacles to doing this is thinking that it's hard in terms of intellectual understanding or that it's hard in terms of you know, mounting and, and using a device, or that it's expensive. None of that is true. Here's a cool star party done in France. This was sent to me for those who, who know him by Olivier. Uh, you can see they're doing gas tubes here, and then they're going to transition to a telescope. So this is in Marseille. So again, it's a wonderful outreach topic. And I'll show you a little bit more about that uh, tomorrow in the RSpec session. 
uh, the software session where you can show live spectra on the sidewalk. And, and whether it's for outreach, once you have a handle on this, which takes what, a couple months at the most, even a few weeks, you're in a position to go into a school and when the schools are open and we feel comfortable going in and volunteering your time as a mentor or to do a, a session out on the football field one night and, and show for an astronomy teacher, a physics teacher, a chemistry teacher, they love this stuff. And so this can be the springboard rather than just sort of showing Vega or the moon or, or M42. This can be a springboard for a little bit more of a scientific discussion. So we'll talk about more of that tomorrow. Here is Uranus and Neptune's spectrum done again by Torsten Hansen with a video camera. Not a cooled system, not long integration times, video. You can see there these deep absorption bands. There's the bands and remember what we saw earlier. If you see a band, it's likely to be a more complex molecule. Here we're seeing the atmosphere, the methane atmosphere of these planets. Of course, when we finally uh, discover evidence that we believe indicates extraterrestrial life, it's gonna probably be by spectra. Where we observe things like we recently did on Venus, somewhat questioned now as to whether what we observe, the spectral signature of the gas, it indicates that there could be life on that planet. And here with a backyard telescope and a video camera, it's something that we all can do. In 1881, Henry Draper observed the spectrum of a comic. Heck, if Hank can do it, so can we. There's a beautiful spectrum and there is the profile intensity graph. These are the swan bands. This was captured by a guy in Northwest India, Vikrant Agnihotri. Uh, in 2013, he was a beginner and now he's, uh, he's an expert. I learned from him and what teacher doesn't like to learn from their student. I do a lot of mentoring. I do a lot of evaluating. Newcomers will send me images and, and I'll throw them into our spec, make a screen recording, give them my feedback on it. Uh, the real joy for me, honestly, is seeing somebody get excited and, and discover what many of us have discovered. You know, I think a lot of us we're a little bit bored with imaging. I wasn't a great imager. I didn't do a lot of it. If you have an image, it doesn't matter. But what spectroscopy has done for me is it, it brought that thrill back. That thrill you may have experienced the first time you imaged the moon. If your moon image was like mine, it was overexposed, it was blurry. It was still the most beautiful image I've ever seen of the moon, right? My wife didn't think so. My colleagues didn't think so. My friends didn't think so, but I knew it was. So spectroscopy can recapture that thrill. You know, thrills being what they are, they typically fade and, and my moon and visual imaging excitement did fade. So here's a more contemporary example of Neo Wise. This is uh, again, the, the, ne uh, the neon, the sodium that we're seeing. And this was done, you see that word objective grading. That's a description of when we put the uh, grading right on the uh, objective lens, right on the front so that the, um, the starlight goes through the grating, the, the light is parallel, and it's not a converging beam coming off the lens like in most cases. And this can be a very advanced instrument that gets very a relatively high resolution. So uh, again, this is a contemporary example to show you. You know, and anybody who uses a C-clamp on their setup, that's my kind of amateur. You know, I break everything, which is one of the reasons I really like the grating because uh, not only is it hard to break, but uh, it's so simple to set up. Uh, in this case, if I had had a C-clamp on my equipment, I probably would have cranked it down too tight, buckled the housing and broken the camera. Fortunately, the guy who did this and put his grating on the nose piece of a video camera didn't break it. His name is Robin Leadbeater. He's the designer of the Star Analyzer and uh, he's on our forum. He's a huge help to tons of people uh, and really a, an expert, like many of the people that you're hearing from in the meeting tonight. He does a lot of slit spectroscopy as well as slitless spectroscopy. Here is a single frame from that video he captured. The comet or the, uh, the meteor traveled that distance in one frame. This is the spectrum. And for example, that gap that's right there is that dip. And you can see the items that uh, uh, he tentatively identified. This is, this, <laughs> Obviously, this isn't something that uh, you do often or with a great amount of data being collected. But, uh, you know, some people love doing this, you know, whatever floats your boat. There's lots of different ways to do spectroscopy. I'm not going to talk a lot about the sun, except, again, uh, one great thing about using a low resolution system is you get to see 
the entire spectrum, the entire visual spectrum. Uh, as you saw uh, from Francoise's uh, presentation earlier, uh, with a higher resolution device, we're only looking at a small window in the spectrum. So we need not only more understanding, but we may need to take a lot of images if we want to look and then stitch them together and process them in the same way. There's a lot of work that can be involved in that. Uh, so the uh, grading does have that advantage of getting the whole spectrum. And uh, again, just real quickly, we've heard a lot about the sun over the last few years, and we're going to hear a lot more in the next few. But uh, this yellow feature here was uh, identified back in 1868 as something we had no idea what it was. And it was uh, 20, 30, 40 years later that we discovered something here on Earth that had the same yellow emission feature, and that was helium. It's a wonderful story. So uh, again, um, you can see here uh, with just a DSLR, you're able to capture novi and, and notice the difference in spectra that different novi may have if that's your bag. Uh, again, we heard a little bit about Doppler shift from Stella the other day. Uh, just a reminder, light and sound uh, waves change in, in pitch or wavelength when they're moving with respect to us. So when a train goes through a station, it's right. Higher pitch when it's coming towards us, lower pitch when it's moving away. You can demonstrate that today in your car. When you're out in the car, whether you're on the freeway, whether you're passing parked cars or trees, you'll hear that swishing sound if your window's open. High pitch to low pitch. If we were expecting to observe this triplet right here, and instead of seeing it there, we saw it shoved over to the side there, we'd know that object was moving away because of that redshift from Doppler shift. On the flip side, if it was shoved over here to the left, we'd know the object was moving towards us. Let's look at a great example. Uh, again, it was talked about yesterday how valuable Doppler shift is. There's lots of different types of supernovae, as you uh, may, as many of you may know. There's one particular type called a type 1A, and it's a binary system where, without getting into the details, the gas from one of the stars ends up on the other star. And when you pour gas on a hot surface, you get an explosion, right? So here's a supernova that, uh, this is a photograph of a different supernova than this one. This one was in M101. Uh, this one, you can see that it's sort of, you can see that there's some sort of explosive shell there of some sort. It's got a shape. It's not just a point. Well, David Strange captured this spectrum with just a nine inch SCT and a star analyzer in less than 15 minutes of integration time. There's the spectrum. And that deep dip right there, we can barely see it there, but that deep dip here helps us identify the type of supernova. And this is one of the activities Pardon me, I'm just going off camera when I'm waving my runny nose. Allergies or something here in Seattle. So we stand on the shoulders of giants. We've all heard that a million times, right? One of the cool things that the giants have figured out, the different types of supernovae have different spectral fingerprints. And let's. this isn't going to be on the quiz. Uh, Stella showed this in small form yesterday. For a type 1a supernova, this binary system, Look at this deep dip right here, down around 6,000. None of the other core collapse supernova types, these types, have a dip that's deep in that spot or has a similar signature. Look, for example, this type one, uh, type two has a huge peak here in the red, but not this silicon dip. So David Strange was able to identify this as a type 1a supernova. This is one of the activities that Stella mentioned yesterday, a pro-am activity as amateurs we can do, helping to classify supernovae. That's the good news. The bad news is they're pretty dim. They're mostly not in our galaxy. Uh, so you need some significant aperture, except for the rare ones that are bright enough, uh, even in other galaxies, to detect on you know, an average amateur telescope. By the way, you can, I mentioned earlier, you can do this with just a DSLR. This is a little bit small aperture to do a lot of dim objects. Typically, we're talking four inch, six inch, eight inch is the sweet spot. If you've got a bigger telescope, we can often use a star analyzer on those also. So look what David Strange and I did. We measured that wavelength in angstroms for that uh, silicon deep dip. And then we recorded it. And then we looked up online where silicon's Emission, emission absorption feature would be at rest here on the Earth. Like if, you know, you burnt beet sand and there's its wavelength and they're different from the Doppler shift of that shell expanding towards us. I couldn't remember the Doppler shift formula. 
but Wikipedia did. And when we plug the numbers in, we've now calculated the blue shift of that shell, the speed with which that shell is expanding towards us with a backyard telescope and less than 15 minutes of integration time. So you may recall Adam Reese and his team did work just before the turn of the century. Uh, they won the Nobel Prize in 2011, you can see there, for studying the accelerating cosmological expansion of the universe. And guess what they used for standard candles? <laughs> Not a star analyzer, but they used type 1a supernovae. They're really common um, standard candles. I think his telescope probably was a little more sophisticated than this, but bang for your buck, you can't go bad with this. $200 compared to his multi-million dollar telescope. And you've got limitless amount of time on this. You don't have to sign up for time. What about the spectrum, for example, of a black hole? So black holes, of course, don't emit light. But the accretion disk, as the matter spirals in and moves so quickly, the matter gets very hot and creates emission spectrum. So David Hayworth in Portland, Oregon, south of us here, captured 3C273. I've never observed it myself. And there's the spectrum. You can see two little dots uh, that are in that spectrum, emission features. Let's zoom in on that. So there it is zoomed in on. There's the two dots, right? There's the spectrum. This was done by Robin Leadbeater with a modified security camera and a star analyzer. So this guy, Martin Schmidt, was in his mid-20s in the 1960s when he looked at this spectrum. There's a wonderful transcript of an interview with his, of his, with him that, that describes how he did this research and his, his personal experience. Uh, it's linked to on our site, and I'm happy to send you the link through the contact form on our site if you have trouble finding it. He couldn't figure out what those peaks were. So he decided, okay, let me go back to square one as a, with a lot of the science we do, let's eliminate things those lines can't be. So he, he looked at the bomber series, right? That hydrogen bomber series, hydrogen alpha, there's the robin egg blue hydrogen beta, other lines. This happens to be Vega, but he just was interested in the lines. This is just my example here. And they don't line up, right? So he was able to say, you know, these peaks through here, I mean, we can't even really visually see those, but they, we can see them here in the, in the profile intensity graph. These peaks are from hydrogen, right? So he was able to you know, move on and see what else they could be from. But they were from hydrogen, and he figured that out. Massively red shifted. So using that red shift, he was able to calculate the distance that this object was away from us two and a half billion light years away using the Hubble constant, assuming it's constant. So the discovery was that this object was so far away, but it was so bright, we could still see it here. It's a remarkable discovery. He was, he was scared he was wrong because it was such a simple explanation. In fact, he went home that night, he describes, he says he told his wife something terrible happened in the lab today. And I think the reason he said that is he was aware of the notoriety and the celebrity dumb celebrity dumb that he was going to get from this announcement. And also he was scared he was wrong. And he describes that, you know, to be proven wrong. And, you know, he overlooked something simple, but he was right. The amazing thing is that this light is so old and has come such a great distance. And yet we can still understand something about it, even though it's come over that great distance over such a long period of time. So, embedded in that light is that information that we can detect on a backyard telescope. Not everything ages as well. Here's Martin Schmidt a few years ago. And I, look, people have rightly accused me of throwing stones in a glass house when I show this. He's got a full head of hair and I don't. But my wife always says dress for success. So I'm always happy well, when I have the opportunity to do that. You can see there's the, uh, that's the hydrogen alpha line there. And I tell you, you know, for those of you at home, you may have experienced this with your spouse or with yourself. And that is, I mean, we're all about color and spectroscopy, right? If you look way down here, it's no longer red. It's starting to little get like gray down there. And my salon, they're not picking up the phone. They're not answering, you know, other salons I can't get in. So, I, you know, 
It's a problem. Like I said, I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. My wife says I should dress for success, but I don't think, in fact, I know she tells me all the time, this isn't it. I wanted to show you one other interesting example here. This is also by Robin Ledbeater. Uh, this is, you can see there at the top, a ciphered galaxy. It's got an active galactic nucleus. So it's a really like a point source. You can't get spectra of like M31 or other big galaxies uh, with a, a slitless grating. But here, much as we did in the previous slide, we compare the galaxy spectrum to Vegas, to known bomber, bomber lines. And look right here, the Vega has an absorption feature. Uh, and we can see here that this galaxy has an emission feature, which is expected, but we can easily measure the offset. Again, the redshift from cosmological expansion. And you can see that uh, Robin measured it here very close to the published value. And I, I love, I mean, that's part of what we all love, I think, in astronomy, love the, the uh, distance and, and size information he shares with here. Um, oh, this, go, this belongs on the previous slide. <laughs> I've changed my slides a little bit uh, for this group, and this, you can still see 3C273 is freaking bright, right? Isn't that amazing? Okay, so I want to, even though this is not a, a slip device talk, just to give you the lay of the land in case you didn't pick it up, because it wasn't really laid out all that explicitly in the previous uh, presentations. These are some of the slip devices. Uh, these are made by Shelliac. That's Francoise's uh, a company, Shelliac. Uh, this is a do-it-yourself printed one that you can print today. But like I said, these that you can see, they're an order of magnitude more expensive. This this gets hot after a while. I think I hope you'll forgive me uh, for taking it off. Um, these are the slit devices, uh, and I want to show you just two quick examples with slit devices, just so you get a sense for the kind of resolution you eventually get. I again. Um, I think probably less than one in a hundred people start with a slit spectrometer just because there's there's a lot over time you learn. It, you don't have to learn it the first day you're using a grading, but over time you learn and have a foundation so that when you transition to a slit device, you end up not having to learn all that older information and can focus and concentrate on all the things that make a slit device effective uh, uh, to use in capture spectra. So um, I want to show you just two examples of slit devices. Uh, so first here we have just standard Vega. You can see the hydrogen alpha. There's that beta at around 4,800 in the robin egg blue we talked about. Uh, and if we wanted to look at this hydrogen alpha feature, <laughs> it would be nice if we could just use our mouse wheel, right, and just zoom in. But it's, that would be like the empty magnification that you add when you're trying to zoom in on a crater on the moon. Eventually, you don't get any more resolution. You just, it gets blurrier and bigger, right? So with a slit device, you can actually zoom in. And that's what the hydrogen alpha feature, this feature right here, looks like in Vega, on Vega with a slit device. Now, your, our resolution is like 0.3 angstrom as opposed to around 50 or so with just a grating. Now, oftentimes, as we saw with Martin Schmidt and the quasar, we compare two objects to see what the differences are. Sometimes one of the objects are just, you know, gas tube lights inside of our slit spectrometer. In this case, let's compare the spectrum of Vega to the spectrum of the moon. So the moon, that blue graph there, it's not really moving appreciably towards or away from us. The difference between those two hydrogen alpha absorption features is because again of Doppler shift. And we can see with a very little bit of math, we can calculate uh, as Robin did here, the, um, the radial velocity of Vega, but this takes a slip spectrometer. So the last thing I wanna show you is, uh, and we'll finish up real quickly is this is a rotating star, this edge coming towards you, this edge moving away from you. So we have a little bit of light that would normally be here that shifted over to the blue and a little bit of the light that would normally be here shifted over to the red. That's what it looks like. See that blue? That, in, uh, unlike Vega, Altair is spinning very, very quickly. And in fact, this was from Coralie's show. I haven't gotten permission from her to use it yet. You can see the example I just gave you. The star is rotating, this edge coming towards you so the light's a little bluer. This edge is moving away from you so the light's a little redder. This is a slit spectrometer spectrum 
the giant's shoulders standing on them. I mean, who would have thought that we could learn so much about a star with so little information? How do you get started? Well, a star analyzer grading I mentioned, uh, some sort of camera, you may already have it, some sort of data reduction software. This is my software I'll talk about tomorrow. This is a software written by Christian Will, Valerie, and there's also Dimitri here. They're a little bit harder to use. Uh, they do some things my software doesn't do. Um, well, I have a lot of people who start with those as I did and then end up using RSpec. Uh, and you may need an adapter or spacers. And the reason for that is because, I don't, don't have the lines here, I thought, this distance from the grading to the sensor has to be not exact, it's not like focus, but you don't want it too far away uh, and you don't want it too close because either one of those, the spectrum won't be spread out the optimal amount. So uh, without getting into the details, there's a calculator on my site uh, where you just plug in, you know, your telescope information or you email it to me and I do it for you. And I send you back a little video and explain to you, you know, what decisions and what there's sometimes some trade offs. Sometimes you need a spacer or two, uh, but you're looking for these green flags over here. So that's on my site. And like I said, I'm, I'm happy to run those numbers. I do that frequently for newcomers. So uh, that's something to think about. On my site, on the links page, are, are some links to some books. Uh, these are all linked to, uh, to Amazon. I make about five cents on each click. I might, I might tell you, it's sort of funny. I've made, I think, $39 over 10 years. I get some, a few cents, no matter what you buy, if you go to their site with a click on, on a, an affiliate link like this, and I've gotten a few cents from people who bought My Little Ponies for their daughters or, or sons, who knows? So this is a great book. I wanted to show you one page from it. There's the book. Um, it's got lots of examples. Here again, he's calling out the helium and oxygen lines and, and you know there's nitrogen. But listen, I have to tell you, for a knuckle dragging programmer, it's interesting, but I don't know the significance of all that. So one of the great things about the book is it's got lots of text. You can see me holding it up there, which explains the significance of every star type of all, all of his examples in lay people's terms, not for astrophysicists, but for amateurs like us who are, are just beginning. It's a wonderful book that I continue to learn from. There's a forum that we've got that uh, includes Robin. I think Ken's a member. Uh, most of the people, many of the people you've heard speak over the last uh, two days and, and then tomorrow are members of the group. Great place to ask questions. Uh, my site has a download link for the software, which is free for 30 days. One really cool thing is about four years ago at the SAS conference, I gave a workshop to about 100 AAVSO members. They had sample data from me. They had their laptops. That workshop was recorded. It's linked to on our download page as well as the sample data. So you can download the software and the sample data, and then follow along on YouTube. In, a, in the space of an hour or two, you'd be doing spectroscopy. And whether you plan to ever do it yourself, you'd have it in your bones as to what it's all about. There are opportunities for pro-am collaboration. Uh, this is some research done a few years ago on BE stars. Uh, all of these, here's Christian, uh, you've heard him, uh, you haven't heard him yet, but he'll be speaking later. These are all amateurs. Uh, Olivier was with Sheliak at the time, and uh, then Bob Stencil is uh, the professional at the University of Colorado. There are more and more opportunities coming, partly because of the new databases and the push that AAVSO under Stella's great guidance and Arnie's before her for spectroscopy. Uh, my software will save files in the format that you need to contribute to the variety of databases that exist. We've come a long ways in the last uh, 50 or 40 so minutes. We, as well as the last 200 years. Uh, as you can hear, I love the topic. I'm so happy to have the opportunity to speak here. I uh, appreciate being invited. Uh, we have a little bit of time for questions. Tomorrow, my uh, software presentation will be a little shorter than this. Uh, we'll look at some examples of how things are done. Uh, we'll have a little bit more time uh, to discuss uh, and again, I want to remind you the, the uh, deep river analogy uh, with the questions you can easily stump me, but I'm happy to try and give you answers. And if I don't have answers, Ken may. And uh, otherwise, our forum is a great place we, where I can work with you to find answers to your questions. So uh, I will stop sharing my screen for now, and uh, we can open it up for questions. Uh, Tom, that was outstanding, as always. Thank you very, very much. And, you know, since... Um, 
since Tom is kind of a shy guy, I will just um, go ahead and plug his website myself even more. I mean, it, it's great. There's so much material out there. And if you're just getting started in spectroscopy, or if you even have uh, experience in spectroscopy, I find you can always learn something new. And I'd highly recommend that you take a look out there because there's, it's just a wealth of information. Now, in the meantime, it looks like we've got a couple questions here. So Jim wants to know, how do you get the lens cap adapter? Great question. On our site, there's a store link and you can click on that link. I think it's uh, $38 or something like that. Uh, we also have an adapter, if you're interested, whether for spectroscopy or other applications, uh, that, that goes on your T-ring right here. And so you can put a star analyzer right here. And then instead of, well, you could use this or you could put this on the back of your telescope. So you can use a DSLR uh, in two different ways. So that's where you get it. Thanks for the question, Jim. Uh, and then, um, second up, Paul wants to know if there's any issues using a 12-bit camera versus a 14-bit camera. Really good question, Paul. I don't know if that's uh, uh, the same guy who asked the question yesterday in another application. It's good you're asking those kinds of questions. For most of what we do, and I, I'd be a little sheepish announcing this in front of all the professionals, but because I only have one high-end amateur here, I can say it. And that is for most of what we do in uh, low resolution spectroscopy, the bit depth doesn't matter. In fact, you can use JPEGs coming out of your DSLR instead of raw images, and in many cases, not encounter a problem. Uh, but uh, so there's really not a lot of difference. You'll go a long ways with even, you know, just uh, standard video, uh, low resolution uh, cameras. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, you're welcome, Patrick. What else? Are there any other questions that people have? I, I know it was like drinking from a fire hose and I, I apologize for that. I just have to get it all in. I can't skip the, skip the stuff that I find so exciting. Oh, I'll ask another question while we're waiting to see if anybody chimes in. Um, for people interested in getting the poster that shows the elements and the spectra, uh, same procedure, they go to the, the store part of your website? Yes. And in fact, uh, yeah, it's on the store. It's on our website. In fact, uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson has that poster hanging in his office. He told me that specifically. So I was sort of proud to hear that. Uh, what I wanted to do was show you one other cool thing. And that is uh, on my site. So there's the store link, for example. Uh, I am sharing my screen, right, Ken? You are. Good. <laughs> At least I didn't mess it up this time. So uh, there's a samples page that has tons of examples, including some of the ones I showed you tonight. Uh, or today, uh, and also lots of details uh, on the samples page. This is, again, since we're, we're talking to the AVSO uh, community here, uh, and which, by the way, if you're not a member, I'd really encourage you to join it. It's, uh, it's a nonprofit. Uh, they do great work, uh, part of which is this enormous gathering. Uh, the work behind the scenes is, is incredible, but they are one of the guiding lights in our field of amateur astronomy. Uh, and their, their liaison to professionals is really important to all of us. Uh, so if you're not a member, it's not expensive. And I really would encourage and request you do that. So our Lyrae, right, our standard prototypical variable. Here is a spectrum done in just two hours with a four inch refractor. You can see it there in the title. Uh, by uh, Solacia in Italy. Notice that over time, it changes in shape. This is the hot end of the spectrum, so it's getting hotter. And notice that the hydrogen bomber lines appear. That's what those lines are. This is the kind of research that as amateurs we can do. You heard just earlier this morning that a lot of the research that amateurs are going to be able to contribute to the field uh, is going to be high cadence observations, observations of this sort that uh, the professionals just don't have the time to spend two hours look and also <laughs> oftentimes their cameras are so sensitive, their instruments are so sensitive, they can't study these bright local, relatively local objects. So I just, this is a mind blowing uh, spectrum, uh, just really remarkable. Uh, the other thing on the site, there's that download link I mentioned. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, because I think, and we'll talk a little bit more about it tomorrow, or a lot more about the software, but in terms of getting started, this video link here, there's that workshop that I mentioned with the sample data. But 
there's no big thick manual to read with the software. None of us want to do that these days. Even if we wanted to, we don't have time. We're busy zoom scrolling on our phones, right? So uh, these are tutorial videos that really, in my mind, true confession here, I think these are part of the secret sauce of, of my software success. And that is, these are like three or four minute videos where I walk you through doing something uh, a little more, bit more slowly. It's not quite as like drinking from a fire hose has been uh, this morning. But uh, if you work through these videos one by one, uh, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit more information about that in the background tomorrow. Listen, we're just about out of time. Are there any other questions? Uh, yes, Tom, you have two more questions. Great. Uh, the first one is from Gord Tulloch. Yeah. You see that there? Or do you want me to read? Oh, yeah, it? I've got it actually. You know, the separation of sensor and grading is important. My spectrum is using it's a, it's a bit. Uh, in order to know where to mount the star analyzer or whatever grading you're using or whatever mount you're using, the, the best and really only way to do it is to plug that data into the calculator on our site. That will take into account the focal length and the aperture size of your telescope. Uh, again, uh, all of the criteria that make up the resolution of a spectrometer with a, a star analyzer is embedded into that calculator that Robin Ledbeater and I developed. So uh, uh, for larger image scale, you would pull it away, but it may be by pulling it away, you don't get any more resolution. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions for you, Gord, on that uh, from our site. There's also a live chat app on our site if you want to chat with me sometime about it, or the contact form or my email address, which I neglected to give. You can just go to the, the site and use the contact form. I'm I, I love answering questions. Uh, the store is a message. Uh, we're temporarily disabled. The sh huh. Well, I'll have to go see that, Jim. I don't know why it would be temporarily disabled. Um, it may be that our host site, it's a third party Shopify, it may be for some reason they were having technical problems. I'll go right out there and take a look at it because I know it was working earlier today. Thanks for those questions. Ken? Okay, well, thank you everyone. This was a great presentation, great breakout session. Uh, we have a break now for 10 minutes. And then after that, there's, um, let's see, a, a breakout session on DIY spectrographs from Tony Rhoda, who's a, a real expert on building your own spectrograph. And um, he has built numerous ones, uh, so that will be interesting. There's Olivier Thizy's Shell presentation. Olivier used to be the co-owner of Shellyac along with Francois. He has a tremendous amount of experience and has been doing this for, for years. And um, the Shell is his spectrograph of choice at the moment. He's doing a huge amount of research on BE stars, so that'll be good. And then we have a presentation on the LISA spectrograph by Olivier Gard. So three good things coming up in about 10 minutes. Uh, I will go ahead and end the session because I need to start up the next session, but and I, <laughs> Zoom won't let me do two at once. So um, I'll just say, Bye to y'all and see you in one of these other sessions in a little bit. Thank you, Tom.